Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Art of Life, and I'm your host, Willow Chang Alion. We broadcast live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m., although, one caveat, obviously we didn't have a show last week. Mea culpa, my apologies. I was on the road traveling in New York City performing at my college reunion. Sometimes we do these things, and given the time difference, a web show is just not going to happen. So hopefully you're tuning in, because we have a great show in store for you. Today, we have a musician in the house, as well as a composer, and what I have dubbed the voice of tomorrow's music, or maybe today's music. And <laughs> I will just say that these are all monikers that I have given this young man, Danny Carvalho. He's got his phone booping because he's a popular Hi. guy. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? How's it going? Turn this thing off. And so, uh, as with many of our guests, because they have their fingers in many different projects and they're busy, you are a very busy young man. We tried to book you a little earlier, but yeah. you were on tour. So, uh, didn't quite work out, let's but. tell our audience out there the creation story of how you came to be. How did you get into music and Kihualu and Slack Key and, and what have you? We just want to know the whole backstory. Okay, well, I was kind of born into it. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, music, because, you know, mu musical families happen a lot here, and I didn't particularly, I didn't really belong to a particularly musical family, but uh, I was born into a family that made music a priority. Okay. Uh, you know, to have it in the house and whatnot, so. Um, my parents are both guitar players, um, and my dad actually began to make guitars at some point because he's left-handed and, you know, it's hard to find lefty guitars back in the I day. I have so. heard this. It's a little easier now, mm -hmm. but back then it was a little hard. The so lefties he's, have yeah. united. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, the, what, they, they, they kind of moved up is what happened. They, uh, like one became, I think the CEO of Martin became left-handed around the turn of the century, <laughs> and yeah. it was like, that was like a huge, like, yay, we're going to all have left-handed guitars now. So, but anyway, yeah, so my parents are both, uh, you know, very musical. And, you know, there's always music playing in the house. There's always music playing in the car. So I started singing along to that up, up, probably around the same time I started talking. Mm -hmm. And then you know, later on, when I, when I got big enough and there was a spare guitar lying around, they, you know, let me start playing it. And, you know, things kind of just took off from there. So essentially you're telling us you had no choice in the matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, yes and no. I mean, well, the thing is, is that I really didn't do anything I didn't want to do mm -hmm. at that age. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, like, I mean, like, you can, you can ask my parents, they just... <laughs> but it was, you know, once I picked it up, it was it just came so naturally because I had a lot of trouble with you know in school as a kid I was very uh, but one thing that always came really naturally to me was art in, okay. in particular music so once I picked up the guitar and once I started you know it became really obvious really quickly that I was much more natural at that than anything we'd found before so, so. that was kind of your calling yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. There's many kind of languages. We've discussed this uh, with frequency on this show. And uh, it's not simply verbal or written skills. I mean, people can be expressive and, and speak the language of movement or music, yes. songwriting, poetry. Uh, so we always encourage our viewers out there to not only give yourself a chance and delve into those arts, but then also be respectful and mindful that people express themselves in different ways. And yeah. thank God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, that, and that's uh, it's, it's a really interesting way to put it because that's totally what it is. It's very... Uh, music has as many complexities without even putting lyrics to it. Music right. has as many complexities as a language does already. Once you add lyrics, then it's li then you're introducing this tension between two languages, and the harmony between that creates something beautiful. But um, you know, you could say the same thing about any art form. Uh, I'm going to just take that and run because we like, we like uh, <laughs> improvisational arts here. And you brought up something I think that's really interesting, and that is um, instrumental music as opposed to music that has uh -huh. lyrics. Yes. So there was a time, I think the last time we had um, a top ten, and I could be wrong, it's possible, but the last time I think we had a top ten musical song that didn't have lyrics, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Axel F., Axel Maybe. Foley from um, 
from the 80s with Beverly Hills Cop and yeah uh, it's been a while you know it's it's, it's been, been a, a really long time but I mean in the in the 50s and the 60s Summer's Place was one of them a time for us uh, this is before you were born wipe out. Romeo and Julio <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah wipe out or yeah. Miser Lou which has both an instrumental yeah. Um, but Dick Dale, a lot of surf rock. I mean, there was a lot of instrumental music that made it onto the radio, and now it just seems like that that has just evaporated. How do you feel um, doing both types of music? I, you know, well, one of the reasons for me to start focusing on singing more was actually that, mm -hmm. was because I noticed that, you know, even within the time I've been, you know, within the short time I've been alive, um, uh, you know, when I was, a, when I was a small kid, I remember. Um, songs by Peter Moon playing on the radio. Um, you know, it's an instrumental song, I think called Pandanus or something mm -hmm. like that, that used to play all the time. And so much even that when I started to play, I started playing the song having never actually sat down to try to figure it out because I knew it that well. It had been played so much. I think of a guitarist is also classical gas. Like yeah, that's the one where yes, people there's roll classical their gas eyes. And <laughs> yeah, there's all those. But it's Stairway to Heaven. Yeah. Uh, but it's, but uh, that's a vocal. But, you know, it's, even within my lifetime, I've seen, I've seen the trend continue uh, more towards vocally based music. And I think that there's something... I think it's part of a larger pattern. I don't really see it as an invalidation of instrumentals as much as I do. People have grown to crave more and more stimulation. Mm -hmm. I feel you know, and, and the more hectic our lives become, the more it takes to kind of get through to that sometimes. And unless people are willing to, um, you know, make an effort to become sensitive to something that's really, really subtle. Generally, it takes, and one of the most innate, uh, one of the most innate responses uh, that humans are biologically programmed to is another human voice. That's true. You know, that's when true. we're when we're first born, that's 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 the one thing that we respond to is the voice of our mother and father. So it's why having a crying baby on a plane is a very uncomfortable situation. <laughs> <laughs> Not because you necessarily want that baby to be quiet, but I mean, there's that response. Yeah, you you instantly think like, well, what's wrong in this situation? Because yeah, we are programmed, we're programmed to, to care. And you know, I'll say as a singer, and I think singers are musicians. I know singers oh, are musicians, totally, but. Totally. Uh, I think another element to that, because I agree with what you're saying about stimulus and that being paramount and kind of being the motivation for people is that they need to have multiple stimuli. However, I think also people are maybe uncomfortable with not na having a narrative. And so when you have lyrics, there may or may not be a story, but there's one that's certainly implied. Even if you're like yeah. Justin Bieber saying, ooh, baby, baby, um, not everybody can be Simon and Garfunkel. I think you actually might have gone lower than Justin <laughs> Bieber pitch-wise on that one, but. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, but you know, yeah. I think it's, it's sometimes the same thing that troubles like modern dance. If you have movement for the sake of movement and there's not a narrative, people get nervous because they're not sure what That's they're true. supposed to take from it. Instead yeah. of giving themselves the free freedom and the opportunity to just enjoy the experience and maybe come up with their own emotion or their own response and trust that that's okay. It's perfectly yeah. fine. And there's there's ways that you can still play with that. But well, you know, I, what, what I f first thought when you said that, the mm -hmm. minute you said that was, that's why soundtracks are still instrumental. Oh, yeah. Because there is a narrative. It's not in the music, but right. the narrative is going on and then you have something. Because that's what instrumentation does that vocals cannot do is it sets a tone without, without the listener being told what to think. It kind of just hints. Yeah. And that's, that's the beauty of it. That's why I pay attention to instrumentation so much to this day, is because that's the part of, you know, if music is a language, that's the part of it that Cue fascinates the me most. Cue the violin. Yeah, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's mystifying on one level, but when you learn, once you learn how to, you know, how to use that. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to find a nicer word. But yeah. once you learn how to once you learn how to, you know, really work with that, you can really enhance almost any mood and um, enhance any narrative. True. Uh, but then there's also uh, you know, even in lyric writing there's an effort, I believe, on the part of a lot of lyricists nowadays to purposely not be so so specific. Mm, yeah. So that it they can still be. let the listener um, 
a it's good a really pronoun. Right. It's a very, <laughs> very tricky balance. It is. Or even if you don't, even if, yeah, avoiding pronouns is one thing. Um, this one songwriter I was talking to said, never use a, the only pronoun that you want to use is, or it's not a pronoun, but like the only, don't use he or she, use right. you. Yeah. Sing it to somebody and then it could be to anybody. This is true. <laughs> it could even be to God. <laughs> yes, yes, Osana. yes. It could. Um, it could. Or all of the above. Yeah. There's a movie that you may have seen just because there's a cult following for the whole James Bond trilogy. <laughs> it's beyond a trilogy, it's a franchise. Yes. And that was uh, Live and Let Die. Okay. Paul McCartney wrote the uh, theme to that. And this might be of interest to you. I love it. It's perhaps one of the most camp of the James Bond films. <laughs> Trust me on this one. And it's got Jeffrey Holder and it's got voodoo dancers and like, <laughs> it's just kind of crazy. But the thing that's interesting about that song is he wrote that song for the film. Mm -hmm. And that's literally like the only song that's in that film. It's just they do variations on a theme. I mean, they really got their money's yeah. worth out of that song. And I was thinking every time yeah. I see that film, I think this would be great for people who are learning composition because it completely drives home the thought that you can have a melody and then just do variations on the theme over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah, and, and music itself is about theme and variation, mm -hmm. but when you, you know, what, one of, that's one of the things I love about soundtracks yeah. is because they expand on that and then they introduce different themes for, they can even introduce different themes for different characters. Um, one of my favorite movies uh, of recent years, not necessarily, I mean, although you know, the production was just phenomenal in terms of the scale, but particularly for the soundtrack was the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Okay. Because that, s the way that they structured those themes to just magnify the grandiose of everything in that film was just, to me it was very spectacular. I, there, there aren't very many times when I find myself sitting in a movie theater marveling and cl closing my eyes, marveling at the soundtrack, and Ooh. that's <laughs> that, that's. I one do of them. if it's Gabriel Yared. <laughs> he did uh, uh, the Lover and uh, English Patient, and, yeah. and many wonderful soundtracks. Yeah. So, okay. So for those who are wondering, like, wow, they're talking about all these soundtracks, and you're an instrumentalist, but you also sing. Yes. So you did go into voice. We share the same voice yes. teacher. We want to say hi to Auntie Neva. Auntie Neva. We're hoping yeah. that you're on a speedy recovery. Yeah. And. Uh, Tell us about the voice, because some people take the leap and they follow through, and others just like to sing in the shower. Um, <laughs> in addition to uh, reaching a wider audience, what was, uh, what was the impetus that was the motivation for you to follow through? Because I know a lot of instrumentalists that want to make the leap, but then they rarely do. Mm. I, I think it was always something that I did aspire to. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, my tendency whenever I see something I like is, I want to do that. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You know, so... Um, you know, I, I mean, I remember even before I could, you know, when I, at times when I could barely sing, you know, when I was like going through middle school and I'd try to sing and what come out was like, ah, um, I would, you know, I would still, I'd listen to, you know, some of my favorite recordings. Some of my favorite recordings of that time were, were vocal recordings. Confess. Uh, like, you know. Some of the Brothers Cos recordings mm. really, really touched Those me. Those are just chestnuts. Just, they never yeah, age. They they're very really beautiful. never do. And they're, what I, my solution at the time was to, since I couldn't sing like Robert, <laughs> <laughs> um, to use my guitar as my voice mm -hmm. and arrange the music so that I could fit it on one instrument and let the guitar do the singing for me. And I covered a lot of ground that way. I recorded two entire albums using that as a basic, as a basic formula. Right. Um, I just eventually began to realize if I could take that complexity on the guitar and then add a melody on top of it, it would free the guitar up to do a lot more groundwork in other areas and other subtleties. And I think there was that combined with you know the growing realization that I am in a predominantly uh, vocal uh, genre of, mm -hmm. and tradition of, of music. Hawaiian music, the, f the focal point of Hawaiian music has consistently been, you know, has consistently been the lyrics. That is what drives both 
the music and the dance and yes. of the and Hawaiian so tradition. So the oli and the mele, for yes, our viewers out mele. there, the oli would be the chant, the mele being the song, being a narrative, uh, a, a narrative form, and also an yeah. oral tradition. And yeah. so it's very reliant on those elements it's, as well. I mean, the purpose, of, the purpose of song in Hawaiian culture is really is to tell stories. And, right. you know, you can't, you can't tell the too many details of a story without without having some words to it. So yeah, but how about one killer <laughs> nose flute solo? <laughs> so we do have that in Hawaiian music, the nose flute. I'm not yes, we do have a nose up. flute, and it's we true. have we have quite a few other things yeah. too. It's 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 very uh, it's very fascinating. But it is. you know, too, it it got to a point where I could no longer I could no longer uh, get around that and. Once I did start singing, though, and once I, once I got my voice to a point where it, I was no longer limited by the melody of a song mm -hmm. as to whether or not I could sing it, you know, then that's when, my, uh, that's when my artistry really, really started to develop is because, because then, you know, I could do whatever I thought was appropriate for the song right. rather than what I could do. It was more. It became about the music as opposed to about me, and I think that was. It was a really crucial transitioning point that happened. That had to happen before I could really take my music into a space that I was that I could celebrate. So. Fascinating. I am going to shift gears a little bit, just a skosh, and I want to ask you about your creative process because I do think that, and even that can change and that can evolve, but. What have been your creative processes or your prompts, um, whether that's meditation or you're inspired by traveling or just lots of practice and it comes to you? Like, what, what do you find stokes the fire of creativity for you? Um, it's been kind of a, it's been kind of a combination of things. Mm -hmm. Generally, um, it, it's, it's been very sporadic. The one consistent thing is that there's always some sort of, there's always, it, it's always very emotional. Yeah. Uh, I, I draw off of life experiences and I draw off of, uh, I draw off of, you know, moments when experiencing art that evoke certain life experiences. Okay. You know, and when you, you know, when you're listening to, if you're listening to a song that reminds you of an event, then that's something worth taking note of because it's but in terms of what actually inspires me uh let's see i i i have this kind of uh running joke with my family that one day i'm going to write a song for somebody who's living because <laughs> <laughs> because it's true somebody passes away and that and you know i've 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 witnessed a lot of people who are very close to me yeah. uh, you know pass this away and this has been quite the year really for yeah yeah. yeah well, this year, there's this year, but this was, I mean, this year, I would say that this isn't, this hasn't been my worst year, though, yeah. in terms of, in terms of the number of, you know, people I really care about moving, you know, moving on from this life. It's been very, um, it, I, I've, I've had, I, I've had quite a few of those. And I think from very early on, I found music to be one of the most healthy, uh, you know, processes of dealing with that. Yeah. So that encompasses a good number of the songs that I've written. Um, of course, every songwriter has at least one song about a breakup. Um, Taylor Swift made a whole <laughs> career on that. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, quick, let me date somebody for two weeks oh, so I can geez. write a song. I need to do, I need to do another album. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> Find a new dating site. No. I, <laughs> um, I was thinking when you were saying all of this about Ka Punaho, right? So uh -huh. everyone is like, that's just the school. But the school's inspiration is based on the legend about spring. the spring, yeah. right? And I was thinking about this. And... I think at times creativity is a lot like a spring because whether you know the water is there or not, it doesn't change the fact that the water is there. It's just about being able to know how to find it and how to source it. So yeah, I feel yeah. like that a lot of times when someone passes over and crosses over, as you said, or transition, 
it's almost like hitting that little spring or that little geyser. You you really you remove an obstacle, whatever yeah. it is, and then it just flows. Do you find? I mean, Maya Angelou, who I never knew, but I always think of her as like a as a distance learning or mentor of sorts. When she passed away, I cranked out three poems in like an hour. I oh, mean, yeah. I just was like, bam, bam, bam. I'm not necessarily yeah. suggesting that they were great or fabulous, <laughs> but the thing that's wonderful is that it was an easy flow to just kind of hop on that wave. Do you find that it works similarly for yourself? Kind of, well, it, it's interesting. So if we were to go a little further with that mm -hmm. metaphor of a spring, you know, there's, 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 the inspiration itself, mm -hmm. but then there's also how you uh, how you enable how well you can enable it to flow constantly, and I think that's another piece that I think that's the piece that was the biggest mystery to me yeah. for a long time because you know, when you're going through school and you're doing all these t different you know when you're doing a million different things with your life other than focusing on that, right. then you, you begin to you know it's like the the irrigation can get clogged with other junk. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> because of <that> constipation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, creative constipation. But uh, it's so, you know, and the m more that happens when that clears out, when something major in your life happens that just like blows everything out of the way and then you get this burst of inspiration that, that certainly helps. There are, I guess, you know, I, d I have found that meditation can help to, mm -hmm. on a very, you know, on a very basic level, just help to, you know, keep too much of that junk from accumulating. That's true. Uh, I actually, well, in my best moments, it's been like that. Uh, That's a but I can never, I can never quite, I can never quite sit still for more than five minutes, though. So it's. That's perfectly <laughs> fine. Yeah, there's walking meditations. There's all kinds. Yes. Um, I read something. It was really interesting. It was called forest bathing. And I regret that I don't have, it starts with a shi, I want to say like shiriki, but don't quote me on that. But it's a, a Japanese concept of forest bathing, where you hmm. walk into a garden or some green area for a certain period of time, and that's a meditation unto itself. And that's, not only does it help your, your sense of well-being, but they've done clinical studies, because you can't just do something because it's good for you. You have to find science to back it. Um, it lowers people's blood pressure and their cortisol levels, and, and who knew getting in touch with nature would be good. Um, on a completely, <laughs> slightly related thing, I was listening uh, to public radio. I think we're both fans. Yay, yes. what public yes. radio. And there was a, a piece about Sting, and I confess I'm kind of a Sting maniac. I have always respected him as He's a musician. Awesome. And, yeah, I mean, just a very well-rounded individual who's gone through so many different facets in his career. Um, he has just scored a musical, which they had a debut last Sunday on the Tonys. They did one of the songs from it. And he scored this musical, and one of the things they talked about is they said, Oh, well, Sting hasn't had, he hasn't done anything in eight years, and he's had this, like, protracted dry spell. And hmm. it was yeah. amazingly dismissive because yeah. it really made me realize that if you're an artist, people are always waiting for the next product. Like, yes. they don't seem to just appreciate what you have created. It's this idea that if you haven't done something for any length of time, then you're just dried up and you're not yeah. contributing. And I just thought, like, like, I'm sorry, do you realize you're talking about Sting? Well, we're also talking, <laughs> this, is, th this is also a piece of pop culture, though. Mm -hmm. it, it's very much, things move fast. Yeah. And people do, you know, you can go from being the guy to uh, not, you know, not being on anybody's radar like very that quickly. that Friday girl. Yeah, well, thank goodness <laughs> for that. But, um, <laughs> but no, no. But it's like, you know, I remember, I remember having this conversation with a, with a good friend of mine um, about two years ago. It was, uh, yeah, it was about two years ago, and we were talking, and the subject of Pharrell came up. Mm. Um, he wears the big hat. Yeah, the guy with the big happy. hat. And, yeah, yeah. So I, actually, okay, now I remember. We were watching The Voice, and he appeared as an advisor mm -hmm. on to the program, and uh, we were we kind of started talking about it. It's like, yeah, what? We, we haven't seen anything out by him lately, other than like, other than a couple tracks on any given Jay Z album. Like, it's like, you know, what's he been doing? 
And I'm like... Just planning to rule the well, world. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but like, I mean, the funny thing is, is that, you know, when he talks about that time now, it's mm -hmm. very, is, is, you know, it's a downtime from labels. We're not really talking to him because they saw music as going in a direction that his style couldn't follow. Yeah. And it wasn't until it like until he, you know, kind of tweaked a few things and then just brought everybody back over to him when You know like, what it is? Boys and girls, labels, know nothing. Yeah, well then what what do they know? Well <laughs> Yeah, well I'll 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 give you you know, a funny story about this one that I was just reading the other day. That song that he did, Happy, was mm -hmm. originally supposed to be for another artist. CeeLo Green, yeah, right? Yeah, and his management didn't like it, so, <laughs> you know. You can't go from F.U. to Happy, I guess. Uh, well, maybe. Yeah. It could be the release you need. It's possible. <laughs> well, it's possible. Yeah. So, you, if you don't mind me saying, you're young and you've already released three albums. Yes. I mean, tell us about this, because... <laughs> Some people can't even get out of the barn with one recording, let alone three. Um, are you on your own type of time schedule, or do you plan these things in advance, or does it just kind of come to fruition and you say the time is now? Or I mean, what is your process with that? It's kind of a combination. I will say that I had a lot of help mm -hmm. uh, very early on, and I had a lot of help in a way that allowed me to take ownership of the process right. when, when I was ready. Uh, the first two albums were very... Very much. It was. It was really a matter of having enough material to put down, and also, you know, having enough people asking about it. Where, you know, Dad sat me down and he basically told me, you know, we could do this. I, you know, I've done some research into, you know, how to, you know, run it as a basic business, and also how to, um, you know, how to do the engineering, what we would need to buy, and it, it's something we can do. So everything so, is self-produced yeah, to some yeah. degree. Yeah, at that at that time, mm -hmm. he w he was he basically acted as the producer engineer. I was, and then he would you know, uh, give me feedback and coaching on. Was uh, it challenging playing. to have the closeness of a family member? I mean, worked <laughs> for Beyonce for a very long time, but I mean, is your relation obviously your relationships is functioning where you can do that? But for some people, that might be a nightmare. We butt heads a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we're a little too Who much alike sometimes. Who gets the final say? We're, we're a little too much alike sometimes. I think um, it, de oh, it depends on when we want to resolve. Right. If you it, flip if, a coin. If, yeah, if, 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 if we want to, if we want to, <laughs> if we want to get something done that night, then then usually he'll get the last word. But like, if I, if I want the last word, I have to wait a couple days. <laughs> when <laughs> you've recorded something, do you allow that time? Um, for example, like when you you can relate to this. I think everybody at some point has had to write a paper, right? You write yes. a paper and in that moment you might think it's the greatest thing you've ever done or you might know it's kind of just horrific. Oh, yeah. And then the next morning you look at it and then again you can either think it's like totally fabulous or just shite. Can I say that? We're an FCC free yes. zone. Um, <laughs> or whether you're painting. Or, I mean, the creative process really allows for that. What you think it is in that moment versus one day, one week, yeah. Three months later, I mean, and and those are very fluid things. That perception. So how does that work for you? <laughs> like you, you, it's in the can and it's done. You hear it the next day and you're like, sweet uh. Jesus, what is that? <laughs> or yeah. I'm a genius. It happens. It happens. But I think, I mean, it's crucial to be able to recognize it at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, to Do you not bring in extra ears. Do you yeah. have like an inner sanctum that well, people I, come and listen? It's kind of. I do that. But I do it really selectively, yeah. and the reason why, uh, and this is something you know, on this past CD, the difference in the process on this past CD was that it was me taking on a lot more of the creative, the creative decisions. It was pretty much I had a, a vision for where I wanted to end up. I had, you know, in terms of a product, I knew what I wanted it to sound like. Mm -hmm. I had it, you know. A team of musicians who understood that, right. and I chose them very carefully based on you know what I felt, who I felt would understand where I'm coming from enough to work towards it along with me. And but what I also found very quickly was that if you're trying to do something that nobody's done before, there's a lot of people who just are not going to get it. Yeah. And uh, you know you can you can lose a lot of morale by. Uh, taking 
some, by taking some of their advice too seriously. Right. That yeah. doesn't mean you don't listen to it. You're it's like, valuable I want to do the Hawaiian version of Kit Sound. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's not it's it's it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you don't listen to it, but. Right. You, you take know, it with you, a grain of salt. You take it with a grain of salt and you take notes that are worth considering. A grain considering. of Hawaiian salt? Yes. yes. Red? <laughs> I'm curious, when you're, you're creating music, there's clearly music that's done that's very studio produced. Mm -hmm. And then there's the organic sound, which people tend to associate with, for lack of a better word, Hawaiian music. So yes. what, at what point do you decide, okay, I'm going to do a lot of... Um, overdubbing and a lot of production things in the studio and kind of go on the side of that concept album or at what point do you say well I want to maintain a really organic sound so this can be reproduced if I'm performing live <laughs> or do you just have a piece and say this is what it sounds like on the CD and this is what I sound like live enjoy both you know that's been what I've been gravitating more towards mm -hmm. recently uh, for this one I for this past album I did, I really tried to strike a balance because right. I knew that I would be performing a lot by myself still yet. I'm primarily known as a soloist, so I knew that was going to happen. I wanted to bring a band with me as many places as I could, but I also realized that there were only so many people I could bring with me. Yeah. Uh, so what I ended up with was going with more of a trio sound for the album that kind of became a theme. Uh, there's one song on here that I did... Um, where I expanded beyond a trio, uh, at least in terms of the number of overall tracks. And I think it was when I was doing that one that I began to realize, okay, you know, it, for a future project, it would be worth going all out with you know, as many pieces as I could just to, just to see how far I can take it. But you know, at some point, though, if you try to make the record so that you can so that you can perform every piece of it. My feeling is that, you know, y you can go the minimalist route and still get a good product, but, or you can go to, uh, or you can just max out on all the production and create something really spectacular and then perform it differently. Right. Uh, there's not, but in terms of gray area in between, it, it's really a matter of what's most worth it because, you know, it, to me, on record, that is one place where all limitations can be put aside. Right. You can really, you can really get any sound you want to on a record. Um, and you know, if there's one place you can put a sound that you can't get elsewhere, it would be there. So why not do it? Exactly. At the same time, you can't let that you can't let that limit your performances either. So I think that it's a healthy balance. They both have to kind of exist in their own right. I often have to explain to people when they buy a CD from the show, I was like, yeah, so I, I did a lot of, you know, I did a lot with this album that you didn't hear tonight. Um, <laughs> no apologies, no apologies. No apologies at all, no. I, I, like, actually, I, I've had a lot of really good feedback on the cello work on the album, so. Yeah. Um, what is the ratio, for those out there who are unfamiliar, between um, original works and then covers? Because there's an established, I think, uh, or an expectation with Hawaiian music, just like jazz, that it's not problematic to do covers. So let's say yes. like Hi'ilawe, yes. it's like, I mean, you got to at some point kind of pay homage or maybe yeah. you want to try to like do justice to some of these beautiful standards and songs. I mean, even Waikiki, I think, fits in that, um, that category. So when you're making a decision, what's the ratio, and how do you decide what songs would make the cut of like a classic genre within Hawaiian music versus your own original works? It's an interesting question. I think uh, my personal uh, guideline is that I try to I try to put as many originals, as much original work as I can, mm -hmm. but I also m measure it up to uh, more classic works. Right. And the reason for that is because, you know, you're right. When in, in the Hawaiian, in the Hawaiian tradition, there are so many standards already, and they became standards because they're such, you know, timeless s songs. Right. And. Or, or somebody made a timeless version of the song and then everybody has to try to live up to that afterward. But either way, that 
that raises the bar. So there's a lot of songs I've written that I'll probably never really record because, not because I don't think that they're okay songs in their own right, but I don't think that it measures up to, I, I don't think that it's on the same level as what's already been done. The stuff that I do put out has, it, I feel does, um, and I put it out because I feel that way. I think it's important for artists to write as much as they can because those classics were all written by somebody and those and you know, this is something that Uncle Dennis, the late uh, Uncle Dennis Kamakahi always really stressed to me. He said, you know, if our history is preserved through melee, through songs, um, then writing is like a duty to every generation because that is the only way future generations will know what our experience was like. Right. So, and, and it, with that in mind, yes, it, it's imperative to keep writing. At the same time, paying homage is also important. And, but I will say that when you're paying homage to certain pieces, you want to make, you know, at least most of us feel a certain amount of pressure to make sure that it's adding something to the table because when you have a song like Hi'i Lave that yeah. about 50 to 100 people have recorded. <laughs> you gotta kind of reinvent the wheel there. Yeah, so you, you, you want to do, personally, I like to do something different with it. That's, my, that's become my new criteria as long for. As it's not Jawaiian. Ooh, I just said that. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, sometimes, depends on what you mean by Jawaiian though. Yeah. I, I do, there was one song that I did that was, I, I did take a reggae angle to it, but mm -hmm. I did it because I had already heard a lot of versions done pretty much the same way. Mm -hmm. And my guideline to doing a cover of anybody else's song, even if it's a tribute, is can I add something new? Can right. I do something that hasn't been done with it before? And with this particular song, it ended up being taking a Hawaiian song with Hawaiian lyrics uh, about a very, you know, about a specific historical event and doing it in a reggae style. And I had this like two minute long electric guitar solo to close the song. There you go. And, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that was, you know, it was, it, was really, it was really kind of a far cry from the original. And I, I remember when uh, Polani Von first heard it, he kind of like, he kind of, he, I, he was sitting in the audience and I kind of saw his head go like this. And then, yeah, and then, <laughs> and then I see him like, Throw his head back and start cracking up laughing about 30 seconds into the song. Good. <laughs> Speaking of song, we have a song that we can uh, queue up. Can you let okay. our wonderful Ian know which track you'd like to have um, in the mix? Yeah, so we'll do... Um, I'm not sure if he actually loaded that one in, but let's, let's do... Uh, let's do number five. Do we have number five we'll queued change up? Change it up. Do we? Awesome. So tell us about the song. I know it's sacrilegious to speak over the music, but... Yeah, okay. Well, this one has a little bit of time, I think. So this one, this is an example of a trio kind of format that I kept, that I was trying to, uh, trying to really maximize. Uh, I think for this song I used a guitar, cello, and bass trio for instrumentation. It's written by the Queen, by Queen Lily Okalani, uh, for her husband. I think it was one of the only Ike ahi ahi po kolu 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 It's one of my favorite to um, the ali'i of Hawaii, Hawaii, very educated, um, very well-traveled, very much global citizens, 
ahead of their time in so many regards. I mean, yeah. gosh, if anyone was going to make a movie about a Hawaiian cause, the Queen, the Queen is yeah. it's begging to be done. It's Maybe such an obvious... There's a lot. There's yeah. a lot there. Um, Even a miniseries. Come on, people. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I think, I think, I think, that I think, uh, I think a drama about, <laughs> about uh, royal life could put Downton Abbey to shame. But, absolutely, um. <laughs> absolutely. Now, yeah. since we have this here, I want people also to get a oh, visual. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about this, because this was a really celebrated album, a yeah. recent release. Tell us about it. Yeah, so this was basically me, you know, coming out of a bit of a hiatus, basically. Mm -hmm. I took a short break to get through college. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and uh, but it was also it was also a period of time where I was really you know s you know doing some soul searching as an artist, trying mm -hmm. to figure out you know what I wanted, what direction I wanted to take uh, my music in. Right. And it just so happened that this was it. it, it things kind of just fell into place after a while into this type of a sound. Um, I. Now, I consider it to be almost a halfway point mm -hmm. because the work on this album and the learning that went into creating this has given me a much clearer vision for where I want to go in the future. But right. um, for now, though, it's a, very, it's, it's a very current testament to what I feel Hawaiian music uh, is capable of. Which leads me right into, wow, you just fed me the question I wanted to ask you, which is, I mean, not that you have to be a seer, but in your opinion, um, not only where do you see Hawaiian music going, but where would you like to see it to go? What do you think is the future of Hawaiian music? The beauty of what I see happening right now in Hawaiian music, because I, 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 you know, I do try to, you know, try to notice, try to notice trends as much as I can, but... Mm -hmm. The beauty of what I see right now is that as a, as a tradition, I, I feel that every decade since that dynamite period in the 70s where like everybody was coming back to Hawaiian music and yeah. really celebrating it for what it was rather than trying to make it into something else. Let's give a shout um, out to some of those artists. Yeah, hey, yeah. I'll throw in CNK. CNK. Brothers uh, Casimero. Yes. Peter Moon Band. Uh, Kalapana. Mm -hmm. Uh, and even uh, Gabby, of course. I got to throw in yeah. Lil Garner because I think she has yes. one of the most divine voices yeah. out there. Just sweet. So all of those. And uh, I, I feel Melvin like with Leeds, each... We yes. can't forget the Tita, yes. Melvin yes. Lee. <laughs> the sister is golden. Yeah. Ever since then, I feel that people have, as artists, have become <laughs> more comfortable uh, embracing... Uh, their Hawaiianness without feeling the need, without feeling the need to make it mainstream. That being said, Brother it's Nolan. always been a theme. <laughs> yeah, it's always been. It, he's a, another part of this theme. Yeah. If you go from Gabby to Peter Moon to you know people like Brother Nolan and all of those guys, there's always this tendency to look outside, out of curi not out of a need to, not out of insecurity, but out of curiosity. Yeah. You know. Hawaii's always been that kind of. It's always been, part. and it, it's healthy because, you know, nobody nobody listens to just one type of music. You know. God, if they do, I'm scared. <laughs> I, I only listen to Gregorian only, chant. Yes. Only. <laughs> Everything else is noise. No. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, so. I go to you know I, I I grew up especially in the time that I've grown up in. People are have become so, multicultural. Mm -hmm. You know fueled by the such free access to information that right. it really doesn't make sense for the music to not evolve in the context of in a global context because everybody in Hawaii every at least every kid in my generation in Hawaii it has access to that and is being influenced by uh, more than just what's going on here so what I hope will uh, continue to happen is uh, an evolution, a healthy evolution that incorporates pieces from outside of Hawaii that um, that the younger generations are identifying with anyway. Right. Uh, so that you know, so that we can you know keep kids coming into coming into the tradition for 
future generations to come. As an example to this, about 20 years ago, uh, there was this group that was doing a really f fabulous job of that at the time. They're uh, called Hapa. Oh, yes. And Very <laughs> fun again in company. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but that, uh, that album, that first album they did is like a perfect example of, uh, of Hawaiian, you know, as a hybrid with yeah, even Kaylee Rochelle. I mean, you couldn't go to a <laughs> wedding Rochelle, without yeah. hearing or the couldn't go to the wedding, but you listen to yeah. a lot of Kaylee Rochelle's work, and you'll hear you'll hear um, you'll hear homages to the Jackson Five. Yeah, you'll hear, Sweet Honey in the Rock, yeah. all kinds of good stuff. Um, and it's I, I feel that the more artists are doing that, the more kids like me will be drawn into it. Yeah, okay? because that's exactly what happened. It was those two artists in particular, Hapa and Kaylee Rochelle, who you know, I was two years old. I didn't know the difference between, you know, between 80s pop rock and... <laughs> um, he was two years um, old. But, <laughs> but I knew that I liked it. And yeah. I, those two artists remained favorites of mine throughout my entire life because they didn't force me to make a false decision between these two cultures I was growing up with. Yeah. So I, I feel that it I feel that it's a healthy process. I hope it continues. I will definitely be using it as a principle for uh, my own my own artistic development. So we're gonna hear some Hawaiian uh, death metal in the future. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, all is possible. It's a song about coup. You know why not? That's so awesome. Yeah. You know I would love for our viewers to know little bit about you, uh, a website, a call to action, yeah. places they can see you perform or things that are up and coming in the future and where they can purchase your album? Yeah, well, the, um, the best place uh, to see where I'm at is my website, mm -hmm. dannycavalio.com. That's where I post, um, that's where I post a good number of my performances uh, ahead of time. And I'm actually working on revamping it right now so that to, you know, make it a even you know, make it a m more user-friendly experience, uh, but that's a good are place. Websites like babies. The work yeah, is never done. The work is never done. Never. Um, and uh, so yeah, and you can also buy the album there. That's probably that's probably the best place to get it. It's also available on iTunes. And About Hawaiian Amazon. books and music. Hawaiian, uh, you mean uh, at. Uh, Namea? Namea? Yeah. Yes, it is okay. there. It is there. That's, if you guys have not, I, we are not sponsored by them anyway, but I have to just say, if you ever want to just go to a place with all things Hawaiian, yeah. Namea in Ward Warehouse, such an amazing yeah. resource of all things Hawaiian. They're great people, too. Yeah. Just really, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's great to support local businesses, mm -hmm. especially when, you know, when they belong to, you know, people that, people like that. So. Exactly. They're, um, the CD is there, too, I think. <laughs> and then where I, can I, we I see you there. perform? Sure do you about. have something coming up at Hoi Public Radio? Or? I do. Yeah. Uh, so I have, um, I actually, I'm actually playing every week now okay. at, uh, in Hawaii Kai at Cha 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 Yay, right on the water there. For those of you who are there. living on the east side of Oahu. East um, side. <laughs> and uh, other, I do, I do have a concert coming up too at, at Hawaii Public Radio. That is going to be on July 19th. Okay, cool. Yeah. So check it out, either on your website or Hoi Public Radio. And he's on Facebook, easy to find. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> Stalk him in the best way. Actually, actually, <laughs> Facebook is one place where I post everything that I do. I post pretty much every performance. And I've got to just give a shout out, because you, um, you have such ethical integrity as a person <laughs> as well. Because it goes beyond music. I think there, that's, there's a consistency where you, you speak your mind, you create dialogue, you encourage people to... Um, share their thoughts and opinions and that's yeah. so important those little it's like electronic salons where people discuss things yeah. I think is great because I think it the is. first time we started talking story on Facebook was about the I know care that whole bumper sticker phenomenon was it that one? I yeah, think it was one it, of those yeah. yeah it was one of those yeah. <laughs> or there's, there's it might have been the Defend Hawaii with the AK-47 yeah although I always that was actually that was actually a friend of mine who wrote that blog yeah, yeah. yeah. so so <laughs> Imua to you gosh yeah. There's never enough time. Um, if you're wondering why the young man didn't bring his, his axe, um, oh, he's, yeah. he's healing the hands because this is one of the byproducts of being the instrument is that gotta, we have to take these things into consideration. Yeah, Same so with the voice. we'll definitely bring Danny back to, to play when yeah. the hands are not as exhausted. But <laughs> thank you so much for being on yeah, the show. Yeah, it was great to be here. Thanks and, for having uh, me. And looking forward to the next project, whatever that may be. Yeah. I, I will say that uh, also if, if you're around in September, there's going to be a project on uh, related to the story of Eddie Aikau. 
Oh, cool. It's going to be a play. Very cool. Yeah. So keep your ears and eyes and your makas open for that. It's going to be good stuff. This is The Art of Life, Willow Chang El Neal. Next week, we're going to have something special for the summer solstice. you got to tune in and mm -hmm. see what it is. And all of our episodes are archived and organized very nice and neat for you up on Facebook, The Art of Life with Willow Chang. You can just scroll on down, check it out when you're at the doctor's office or the bus stop or what have you. <laughs> Send the link to your friends on the mainland and uh, click like because that's so importante. Have a really wonderful weekend. Aloha. <laughs>